been influenced by him. In order to have something new to write, he had to have something new to live. And he fell in love quite a few times. He's complex and deeply flawed, but there he is. Hemingway, the man, is much more interesting than the myth. Stream Monday or tune in at 8 on MPT. Programs on MPT are made possible by our members and the following. 71 acres in downtown Baltimore devoted to learning, discovery, care, and service. We train the professionals who secure the health, well-being, and just treatment of Maryland citizens. We create the knowledge that cures disease and strengthens communities across the state and around the world. UMB makes the world more just, more enlightened, healthier, and more humane. We are UMB. We at Sage Policy Group recognize that this is a challenging period for households and businesses. But Marylanders are intelligent, strong, inventive, and entrepreneurial. Eventually, this economy will bounce back stronger than ever. Make inroads into the education field or advance your current teaching career through UMBC's professional master's programs and certificates in education, instructional systems development, college teaching and learning science, and TESOL. Claim your future at UMBC. State Circle is made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. The police on trial in Minneapolis and under the microscope in Maryland. As usually is the case when you have very serious legislation where compromise is necessary. I stand opposed to this bill. I, I, I know we may have some amendments that are coming, so maybe we'll see if that can improve it. A second chance for those who killed as kids. Some actions have lifelong consequences. The mental state and the brain development of a juvenile is very, very different than an adult. Fighting for a piece of the sports betting pie. We are also comfortable with casinos and racetracks having access to our content, provided that we are treated with parity. And a plan for a big gift from Uncle Sam. Connecting Marylanders to their government. This is State Circle. Good evening, welcome to State Circle for the next to last full week of the General Assembly session. With time now growing short, lawmakers met late into the night this week to try to reach agreement on new police reforms. Charles Robinson has the story. I, I'm, I stand opposed to this bill. I, I know we may have some amendments that are coming, so maybe we'll see if that can improve it. Thank you, Mr. President. It got testy as the Maryland Senate took up Speaker Adrian Jones' Police Reform and Accountability Act this week. It's House Bill 670. The acrimony between the two chambers is elevated. And so what we've moved from now is a uniform statewide process for police discipline, police accountability, to a bill that now relegates this to local jurisdictions. Would you say that to some degree you are talking to two audiences with, with, with the work product you have done uh, most recently to demonstrate to them that they are going to have to make some moves as well as, as usually is the case when you have very serious legislation where compromise is necessary. And so as they move through their process, I'm sure they'll hear what we say here today, but the debate is, is focused on um, you know, the, the, the senators here on this floor and, and making sure that they understand the process and, and what we've put forward tonight. Here are some of the divisions. The House bill would create administrative charging committees. In the Senate, they wanted to be centralized clearing houses. Mental health screenings of officers would occur every year in the House version. The Senate would make them random. 20,000 officers a year, every year. The cost of that and whether there are enough qualified people to actually do them all every year? Uh, I don't think there are. If an officer is found guilty of misconduct, not only would they be removed from office, they would have their pensions terminated under the House bill. My telephone has been full of officers that I worked with, and they all said, don't have to worry about me being out there, right? 
the retirements come July 1 are going to stream in. Efforts to kill the bill went nowhere. The amendment process began near 11 p.m. Despite rejections, several made it through. It includes a change in language, a GOP initiative to have officers know their charges, and the Senate agreed to let a judge decide the forfeiture of pensions. With less than two weeks to go, there isn't a whole lot of time for a police reform bill. But if it does get to the governor, he'll have six days to sign it. After that, he can veto it. But is there enough time for the legislature to override it? In Annapolis, I'm Charles Robinson for State Circle. Emotional debate in the House this week on a bill allowing juvenile offenders who were tried as adults and given long sentences a chance to have their sentences reconsidered. Sue Copen reports. Our justice system must never be about vengeance and revenge. It has to be about something more than that, because that's a demonstration of who we are as a people in this state. This is about justice, and this is about the law. Some actions have lifelong consequences. Up for debate, House and Senate versions of the Juvenile Restoration Act. It would impact as many as 400 people who committed crimes as a juvenile, were tried as an adult, and are now serving at least 20 years in prison for crimes like rape and murder. The legislation would end sentences of life without parole for juveniles convicted and sentenced as adults. It would allow for sentences less than the required minimum, and it would allow for a reconsideration of a sentence after the individual had served at least 20 years. This legislation goes beyond our neighboring jurisdictions that already have this law in place in D.C. and Virginia at 15 years. The mental state and the brain development of a juvenile is very, very different than an adult. Our Supreme Court says that, and this bill will align our state with the Supreme Court. House sponsor of the legislation, Prince George's County Delegate Jazz Lewis, says victims and their families will not be forgotten. Victims can come before, they can come in the future uh, when someone has this potential resentencing hearing. Uh, and have a statement. They can testify in person if they want. State's attorneys will be able to testify either in support of them being released or making sure they don't get released. There is no guarantee in this bill of anything other than a potential opportunity. Despite repeated efforts to amend the legislation. I have an amendment. I have an amendment at the desk. I have an amendment at the desk. The results were the same. Clerk will take the call. The amendment fails. This debate is to remind us all that these are real crimes with real victims. And a change in the law like this should not be done without a full understanding of what it means. There are some crimes and some criminals that we believe life should be life. It's an opportunity. Because if you believe in the system, which I, I don't have a lot of faith in, but every now and then you might find that one spark, that one person that actually learns a lesson 20 years after they committed a horrendous crime. With the Senate giving final approval to the legislation today, it now heads to the governor's desk. I'm Sue Copen for State Circle. It's a race between the COVID variants and the COVID vaccines, according to Governor Hogan. The governor announcing this week that all Marylanders age 16 and up with certain medical conditions or disabilities are eligible to be vaccinated now, along with everyone over age 60. 2.8 million vaccine doses have been given in Maryland, but the number of people hospitalized has been growing as well as new disease variants spread. The hospital count today, 1,045. Three weeks ago, it was 765. Everyone age 16 and up can now pre-register at covidvax.maryland.gov or call the state's vaccination support center 855-MD-GOVAX. That is 1-855-MD-GOVAX. This week, Governor Hogan joined with legislative leaders to announce a spending plan for the nearly $4 billion coming to Maryland through the American Rescue Plan Act. 
1.1 billion will be used to shore up the state's unemployment trust fund for the next two years. Over 600 million will be used to provide additional help with the reopening of schools and 300 million dedicated to improving broadband technology around the state. Maryland has once again shown the nation that people from different parties can still come together, that we can put the people's priorities first, and that we can deliver real bipartisan common sense solutions to the serious problems that face us. We are so excited to be able to announce today a substantial, a historic, a record-breaking investment in, the, in, in order to ensure that we have a resilient broadband infrastructure, both on the physical and on the, on the human knowledge that it takes to make sure that every Marylander can be connected. Together, we, we will be able to invest an additional half a billion dollars in shovel-ready construction projects to get Marylanders back to work. The plan also allocates $50 million to help Marylanders with utility bills and $54 million for additional help with the state's temporary cash assistance and temporary disability assistance programs. High stakes for lawmakers writing the bill to govern Maryland's new sports betting industry. Voters approved a referendum authorizing sports betting, but the details are up to the General Assembly. In Baltimore, where a casino and the stadium complex are neighbors, the teams don't want to lose out on the action. We spoke with Orioles chairman John Angelos. If the state of Maryland does approve sports gaming, at, given that the Orioles and the Ravens are the creators of the NFL and the Major League Baseball content, and we spend considerable amounts of money, hundreds of millions of dollars to create it. We have said we are also comfortable with casinos and racetracks having access to our content, provided that we are treated with parity. The complete interview with Mr. Angelos airs on Direct Connection Monday. The casinos are currently in the bill to receive automatic full-time sports betting licenses along with Laurel Racetrack. A parade of electric cars around State Circle this week to add fuel to the debate over climate legislation. The House and Senate are at odds over how ambitious the state should be in setting emissions goals. The Chesapeake Climate Action Network organized the event to back a requirement that the state reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 60 percent from 2006 levels by the year 2030. Joining us for the Annapolis Faceoff this week, Delegate David Moon, a Democrat from Montgomery County, and Delegate Lauren Aracon, a Republican from Baltimore and Harford Counties. Thank you both for being with us. Thanks for having Thanks me. Thanks very much, Jeff. We are here to talk about uh, marijuana legislation, and I'll note that a couple of other big states have taken moves already this year towards legalizing recreational marijuana. Delegate Moon, you have a bill that would be a step in that direction? Well, I've been trying to focus on part of my motivation this year on marijuana legalization, which is that we are currently criminalizing people um, for a range of behaviors related to this. So uh, as we watch other states beginning to legalize all around us, Virginia, New York, New Jersey, DC, um, I'm trying to make sure that as we uh, get one step closer to that, we at least stop putting people in jail. So um, we did decriminalization in the past, but we decriminalized the smallest amount of marijuana um, of almost any state in the country at 10 grams. So I have a bill to uh, simply up that to a much more um, normal amount at one ounce and just make it all the, the less likely that we're going to be sending people to jail for this. Your bill has passed the House was sent over to the Senate, and at our taping time, I don't think a hearing has yet been scheduled. Yeah, and the Senate has heard this uh, proposal before. We actually passed it last year, um, but the pandemic uh, cut that session short. It was uh, um, my hope that it was going to be completed in both chambers. So again, I think at this point, everybody's actually pushing for full-blown uh, marijuana legalization. 
in Maryland. So at least getting this done while that conversation um, settles out would be uh, pointing in the right direction. Delegate Arakan, your, your thoughts on, on this bill and legalization generally? Yeah, I think there's just some pieces that are missing that we need to really make sure that we address before we move forward with this. The first is obviously that the federal government needs to uh, get up and start doing something about this issue. If this is where the whole country is deciding to go, we need the federal government to, to stop um, penalizing people for it. But uh, we're not there yet. The federal government has, has not made any big moves on, on that topic. The second major thing uh, that concerns me uh, is that we don't have a, a good rapid test for, for driving. And so um, accidents are happening in places like Colorado. I have uh, my sister lives in Colorado. My mother has a home there as well. And uh, they have both been hit by people who after uh, the accident occurred admitted that they had been using marijuana and they were not given tickets because when the police officers asked them, they said that they were not. Um, so that that is very concerning to me that that we could be putting people people's lives in danger um, and and risking and then losing their lives in car accidents to people that could be uh, using drugs and and no real way of us proving how much was really in their system um, so that they can be held responsible for that. So short of um, requiring a, a blood draw, I guess there there's there's no breathalyzer for pot. Right. There's no breathalyzer. And, and even the, the common ways of testing for it don't do a good job of telling telling the, the authorities how someone how high someone is at that moment. I mean, uh, some of the tests can can pick up um, marijuana use from days or weeks or maybe even months earlier. So that is my concern with 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 moving forward. With, well, without let me ask good science. Delegate Moon about that, because I'm, I'm picturing, you know, the uh, the three lane portion of the Bay Bridge and they're doing alternate lane traffic. And I wouldn't want to be up there if if somebody's high coming at me in the other direction. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of, a, I think, a, a common misconception about this. We now have years of data um, from states, both in medical decriminalization and now legalization programs. Um, and by and large, actually, uh, the accident data does not, um, and youth use and other things have not br brought out alarming increases like uh, one would have expected. Um, and where we are seeing some crash data, I think what you're beginning to see is that alcohol um, is involved in some large number of those, that it's not just uh, marijuana use. And so many of us have pointed to the fact that if that's your concern, um, alcohol actually should be uh, a much bigger uh, problem than we're seeing for marijuana. And I think the data does actually um, bear that out. And, you know, to this whole point about there not being a test, I think that's right. You know, it's not apples and oranges with alcohol and marijuana. We don't have a test that, that can tell you whether someone's actually impaired. Um, and the tests are very sensitive. They can tell you, as uh, Delegate Erican says, whether you're using it two weeks ago, which is not very useful. Um, but that's the problem we have now with not just marijuana, it's with opioids. So, um, you know, the field sobriety tests that we're familiar with, it doesn't mean we're not doing anything. Um, it's just that how we test for that will not be the same as for alcohol. Let, let me ask both of you, give you both an opportunity to talk broadly about the pros and cons of this for about a minute each. In, in the context of the polling, the, the Maryland uh, Goucher poll out a couple of weeks ago had, I think, two thirds of Marylanders in favor of legalization of recreational marijuana. We, of course, already have medical mm -hmm. marijuana or cannabis in Maryland. Um, half of Republicans in that poll were, were for it. But at the same time, there's the federal issue and President Biden recently uh, dismissing from his administration a number of people who have used marijuana in the past. How do you see all of this going forward? I can go if you want. Uh, um, I, I'm definitely concerned about moving forward with anything like this without uh, getting the federal government on board. I don't want to see, you know, people opening up dispensaries and then having the federal government come down and arrest people. That to me, that is really, really putting our citizens in danger. Um, and I agree with Delegate Moon on on some of the concerns around other drugs, but I, especially with opioids, you can do a blood test, a t blood test for opioids um, at the hospital. That that's not effective for for marijuana. So I really hope that we 
we wait till we get a good indicator from the federal government on where they're going to go with this issue before we start putting our, our Maryland citizens at risk of being caught up, being told that something is legal at the state level, and then having them end up in a federal prison. That That's very concerning to me. Well, I guess all I'd say about that is um, the problem is in the meantime, we are creating harm. Uh, thousands of residents a year are still being arrested. They're being given criminal records. Um, it, it's a huge waste of time and resources to make them um, harder to employ, harder to get into school with that kind of um, criminal record. You know, the polls say two thirds, as you note, support legalization. But I think the other interesting poll I would point to is that at least half of Marylanders will admit to having tried marijuana at some point in their life. And so we've got to reconcile, did they get away with a crime for which they should have been in jail when they did it? Do we really believe that for half the population? I don't think so. And so I think we've got to align our, our policy with that expectation. Delegates Moon and Arakan, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For the Political Roundtable this week, our Sue Copen, joined by Brian Sears of The Daily Record, thedailyrecord.com. Brian and Sue, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. This uh, session of the General Assembly ends a week from Monday, so things are starting to move at our taping time. The big news today had been the confirmation that the, the confirmation that was held up for a while of Governor Hogan's appointee to be the health secretary, Dennis Schrader. The vote was not close, but but there was strong debate over this. Uh, Jeff, there well, there sure was. It was almost an hour's worth of debate. And even among people, who are dem a lot of Democrats who voted for him, they expressed some strong concerns about the handling of the vaccine rollout and what they saw as the administration's treatment of minority communities over the last 11 weeks. And the concern was, it really came through in, in the discussion, such reluctance to, to vote for the secretary, but there were a lot of others who, one senator in, in fact, suggested that it wasn't entirely the acting secretary's uh, fault that a lot of things weren't coming together as quickly, uh, they, choosing to point a finger up to the governor's office instead. And, and then there were the others who said, well, if we don't approve this appointment now, which is basically a short term, because there are only 18 months left, we'd have to go through this process all over again, and who knows where we'd be at that point. I'll note that uh, Mr. Schrader uh, joins us live Monday night at 7 on Direct Connection, taking viewer calls on the vaccine rollout and vaccine availability. So with uh, just over a week left, the budget uh, has to be passed by Monday. It was approved today, and there is also this huge and unusual supplemental. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, again, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Uh, again, Jeff, I mean, we're, you know, it's pandemic related. I mean, you know, almost $4 billion in federal aid that has been whacked up among a number of priorities, both uh, in the administration and the legislature. Um, there's a lot of things here that are going to, that, that um, are going to get done and money for, you know, expanded broadband, uh, money to bolster the, the, uh, the uh, unemployment system, which is really important if you have a small business in Maryland and you were looking at paying more in terms of your unemployment premiums, and then a lot of other, uh, uh, other uh, one-time expenditures to help uh, people and businesses who are struggling because of the last year. It is an unusual uh, circumstance, to say the least, in a time of a pandemic, to have this kind of money to play with and to use and to allocate to those who are in great need. Um, because generally when, when you see budgets, it's like uh, they keep trimming a million here, a few million there, maybe a little bit more than that. But when you go into the billions, it's, uh, it's kind of mind boggling. I, I thought it was interesting, Brian, that the speaker pointed out how uh, important the out of door activities were during this time of the pandemic and that this uh, additional allocation will allow for uh, new parks, I believe she said, in every single one of the counties that there'll be an offering of even much more to do for people to get outdoors. You know, and yeah, normally, I mean, you know, uh, go ahead, Brian. No, I was going to say, you know, they're, they're in, in some cases they're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for things like, you know, rec and parks projects and for um, the expansion of broadband, both into rural areas and into, uh, <clears throat> into Baltimore City, which is not only seen as, a, as an education improvement, but also economic development. 
Um, the, the list on this was really pretty extensive. I mean, it, it, it was kind of interesting to see exactly how far $3.9 billion can really go. And how quickly they could reach agreement. I mean, the other thing normally in a, when the state has a recession, unfortunately, is uh, the budget has problems. Revenue dries up, expenses increase. Not the time uh, this time around. But before we run out of time, I, I wanted to talk a little about the police reform legislation, which has an artificial deadline of Monday. If the legislature wants to get it to the governor's desk in time to require him to make a decision, before lawmakers adjourn. So if there is a veto, they'd have a chance to override. Conference committee will be working, I guess, this weekend. We can only assume that that's the case. I know the House has appointed its, its members to the conference committee. I, we've, at the time of this taping, I've not seen who the, the Senate has, has put on to the conference committee. They have their work cut out for them. This has become a very contentious issue. I mean, it was it, it was already a contentious issue to begin with, but the House and the Senate are in very different postures on this. Um, we, we've seen a number of members in both chambers um, sniping a little bit at each other on social media. Um, and, you know, if, if you, it doesn't, you don't have to look back very far. We can go back to, for example, 2016, when some of these measures came up following the death of, Fre of Freddie Gray um, and, and didn't pass to see that um, it, it's, not, it's not inconceivable that if they can't set aside the, the, the more emotional concerns that they have that that we could come down to signy die maybe with with not a deal or, or with not a deal that everybody really is happy with and and there seems to be broad agreement among legislators about at least the broad outlines there, there are a few differences procedural differences but as you said there have developed some some hard feelings between Democrats on on each side of of the uh, state house corridor going to be interesting to see how this thing uh, moves forward in the, in the very limited time that's left. Before we go, uh, just half a minute, I wanted to note that we have gotten through 90% of the legislative session, knock on wood, without a big uh, COVID problem. The Senate is meeting in the hall of plexiglass. The House is spread out among two chambers. Everybody's been vaccinated for the most part, but it's pretty remarkable to me that we've reached this point. I think everybody would probably agree with you. It was not expected to go quite as smoothly, even, I mean, every day it's like you're, everybody's holding their breath and that adds to the tension because you simply don't know. Sue and Brian, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Jeff. And that is State Circle for this week, Monday on Direct Connection, Social Distancing at the Ballpark. We'll have our full interview with Orioles CEO, John Angelos. Join us Monday evening at 7. Now for all of us at MPT, thanks for watching State Circle and have a good night. This program was made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities. Programs on MPT are made possible by our members and the following. Every month, the Wisenwell Center offers a wide variety of virtual classes that will keep you active, engaged, and social this winter. For more information, visit choosekeswick.org or call 410-662-4363. What's your next move? Extend beyond your current position or make inroads into a new field through UMBC's professional master's programs and certificates in systems engineering, integrated product development, technical management, and more. Claim your future at UMBC. 71 acres in downtown Baltimore devoted to learning, discovery, care, and service. We train the professionals who secure the health, well-being, and just treatment of Maryland citizens. We create the knowledge that cures disease and strengthens communities across the state and around the world. UMB makes the world more just, more enlightened, healthier, and more humane. We are UMB. Next time on Midsummer Murders. The victim is professional cyclist Greg Eden. When the winner of a race is killed, the cause of death is a surprise. He was poisoned. Barnaby wonders if the motive was winning. What about rivalries? It's a competitive sport. There's always going to be a rivalry. And he has a lot of suspects. The list of text messages he received.